So good evening and greetings and welcome to our next installment of New York Presbyterians and Columbia Children's Health ongoing webinar series on critical topics in pediatrics. Now, previous webinars have understandably focused on COVID-19 issues in children, but today we're going to shift gears a little bit in a way to discuss what may just be an existential issue confronting our country, racism in its many forms, specifically how it impacts healthcare for our children tonight. We've titled our webinar, our webinar, A Framework for Achieving Health Equity in Pediatric Care. It's a lot of ground to cover, so let me introduce our distinguished panel. You have their titles in the flyer and you'll be receiving a summary document after the webinar highlighting tonight's most important points. So let me just introduce them by name in no particular order, but wave so people know who's who there. Dr. Linda Aponte Patel, Dr. Marina Catalozzi, Dr. Hedy Cunningham, Dr. Stephanie Levinsky Desir, and Dr. Dodie Meyer. And I have permission from our uh, panelists to just address them by their first names because we want to make this uh, very conversational. And by the way, uh, down at the bottom of your screen there, you'll see a Q&A uh, section there. If you want, if you have some questions to ask, we'll try to get to them, put those, uh, put your questions in there, not in the chat uh, box. And we will try to get to answer your questions. So everybody ready? Okay, good. We're nodding. That's a good thing. So let, let, let's stand, because I think some of this is still um, foreign territory uh, in some ways for a lot of us. I don't know that, that many people self-identify as, as racist, but uh, as we're finding out um, more recently, there's a lot going on there that might actually be racist or qualify as racism. Um, do we have something, I think, Stephanie, you were going to start out with, tell us a little bit about some of the categories of racism, things that might actually uh, qualify as, as racism. Um, yeah, I'd be oh, happy to actually. That. that was heady. My, <laughs> my bad. See, already a rookie mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, I think you're muted. You're Heady. muted, Hetty. The most important, sorry, the most important category um, that we want to pay attention to is structural racism. And I think when people think about individual actions and, you know, maybe racist behaviors, what we want to remember is that we're all within the United States and, and also in many other countries, we're living in a country where systems have been set up for the past you know, 300 years that we have been living in so that you know, the founders of our, of our country, the, the writers of our constitution owned slaves. So ev at every level, um, the people who, who came before us in medicine were writing the textbooks. They had slaves, they were experimenting on, on um, their slaves, on black people and on poor people, immigrants. So and all the way down. So it's very hard for us to divorce ourselves from the air that we breathe and the, the daily um, media that we're consuming, um, you know, video of, of, of what's happening in our country. So when we think of our individual actions, I think that this idea of being anti-racist is this new concept that people are grabbing hold of because it's not enough for us to just say, well, I'm a good person and I'm not a racist person, but the fact that it's in the air that we breathe means that we want to be acting against this current, this very strong current that we've been um, living in. So that, so that's, so structural racism is really thinking about um, social determinants of health, redlining, all these legal, um, political systems that we are functioning under and that have put some people at the top and some people at the bottom and some people having very poor health care as a result. So how can we level some of these inequities? Um, and so that's when we think about structural racism. Then when we think about interpersonal racism, that's really like what we've absorbed and then how we might be acting based on what we absorbed. Um, and then internalized racism starts to think about um, people, people of color who maybe 
have lower self-esteem or who maybe are thinking about themselves in a negative way because this is the air that they were all breathing. So those are kind of the three big categories that we're talking about. So how would Hetty, either you or, or any of our other panelists there respond to what I hear all the time is, well, that was hundreds of years ago. It's not that way anymore. We don't have slaves. We don't have, uh, you know, uh, African Americans, women for that matter, have the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have this kind of structural racism. How, how would any of you respond to that kind of argument back? I mean, I think, I, yeah. Go ahead, Hetty. Well, I, I was just going to say one, you know, in, in the year 2002, the, I, I think that we can talk about health, racial and ethnic health disparities as a sign of how these um, inequities are, are continuing. And I think some of the panelists here are expert on that even more. But in the year 2002, Congress asked the Institute of Medicine to look at, you know, are um, minority populations and majority populations in this country receiving the same level of care. And before this uh, Institute of Medicine report came out, I think the majority of white Americans in this country felt that ethnic minorities, black Americans were getting the same level of health care and had the same level of health as majority populations. Once that um, report came out, we realized that there's these big health disparities in this country. And so these inequities are continuing to play forward in so many ways. And I know that there's other experts in that, in this group. Let me chime in here with an example about uh, a specific example of how structural racism exists in our country and how these are social determinants of health. So I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and I study asthma and it is very clear that all asthma is not the same across the country. There are communities and places where there are children living in communities where their exposure to triggers in the environment are higher putting them at increased risk for developing asthma and at increased risk for having asthma exacerbations. Hetty mentioned earlier about redlining. So redlining was this practice of uh, de designating certain communities as high risk communities where, you know, lenders did not want to fund those neighborhoods. They tended to be predominantly uh, African American black minority populations. Well, those specific communities, there are studies that have demonstrated that those specific communities have higher exposure to some environmental pollution, such as uh, traffic related pollution, like diesel exhaust pollution. And why? Because those are the same communities where highways tend to pass through. So trucks that are passing through every day, increase volume, increase the uh, concentration of air pollution in those communities. Those also tend to be the same communities where things like waste transfer stations get placed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the garbage trucks that are moving back and forth through those communities, some areas like in the Hunts Point neighborhood of the South Bronx, well, there's tons of diesel traffic that's going through those areas that have higher levels of asthma morbidity and asthma mortality. So when we say that racism doesn't exist because slavery is abolished, that does not, that doesn't even come close to explaining what we're really experiencing here in this country, which are these policies that Hetty was describing that have set up certain communities to be very much disadvantaged from a social perspective and then ultimately resulting in poor health. Yeah, I just wanted to add that after millions and millions and millions of dollars spent by this country and government and Congress and all the Na National Academy of Science of trying to understand disparities, you know, as Hetty pointed out, we're 18 years after this initial report and in almost every single in health indicator, those disparities continue. Infant mortality, cardiovascular disease, uh, obesity, I mean, even the COVID-19. <laughs> we we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Management, maternal mortality and on and on and on and on. So there's not, I think, one single part of our bodies in the children's body that's not affected uh, by consequences of structural racism that cause these disparities. So let me ask this question because some of what we're describing here is things that are done or not done to or for uh, children is what we want to talk about today, of course. Um, 
things that are done to or for them in terms of their health care. But as Hetty pointed out, there's this issue of internalized, uh, what you internalize because of uh, the structural racism in the air that, that we breathe, that also has, a, has an impact on our health. Can one of you talk about that? Because I think that's a, that's a part that's often missed. I think there's just so much overlap as an adolescent medicine provider. I'm just going to give you an example of um, uh, how, how this might play out um, and how it does play out, unfortunately, in many of the um, young people that I care for. Um, so if you are a black male um, who is 15 years old um, and uh, jump a subway um, stall, um, you are much more likely um, to uh, enter into the juvenile justice system than you're, if you're a 15 year old white male. Um, and sometimes they might be with their friends um, who are of a different race, but they get targeted. Um, so some of that is interpersonal. The structural piece of it is the juvenile justice system, which while we have decreased rates of um, uh, young people who are incarcerated, we still have uh, disproportionately higher rates of young Latinx and um, African-American, um, both males and females. Um, when they are in the system, they get treated differently. Um, so they are, um, you know, uh, experiencing adverse childhood experiences while they're there. Um, bias, um, they might be harmed physically, emotionally. Um, and then they start to think, well, um, perhaps I deserve this. Um, if you're being told every day um, that you are not good enough, that um, if you are not making bonds with your, um, if you're in an education system where the teachers um, uh, also, um, or the system brings in a piece where you're not bonding with someone, or maybe you have some undiagnosed um, learning difference um, where people say like, oh, that kid's just lazy. Um, that all gets internalized. Um, so when I see a 16 year old who doesn't have a lot of hope um, because um, the uh, folks in their family, maybe men in their family have been incarcerated or have um, uh, been involved in things that um, uh, because they also weren't uh, part of a good education system, um, it really harms them. Um, and so that sort of stress of uh, those ACEs, those adverse childhood experiences, we know that that increases cortisol, it decreases your immune system, it uh, changes the way you think, it, uh, it makes you more likely to um, eat poorly and be overweight or obese, it makes you more likely to be depressed. Um, but then also, if you don't have a lot of um, uh, resilience or hope in yourself because you have not been in a system or a community or a healthcare system that's supporting you, um, then that is, uh, to some degree, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so it's, it's critical as pediatricians um, to make this part of what we advocate for. So I cannot just advocate for um, uh, vaccines um, and healthcare visits. I need to be advocating against a system that will incarcerate and treat um, a 15-year-old um, in a way that is uh, not humane or that puts them in an education system, that puts my patients in an education system where they cannot um, they cannot um, uh, really compete with someone who uh, uh, is in a, you know, a, a, a zip code away and is getting a very different experience. So um, those are sort of critical ways that it's, it's not just about internalized racism, it's about how structural racism impacts um, interpersonal racism and then impacts how um, folks um, uh, internalize that as well. So this kind of chronic toxic stress really does have a, a, a true, phys, phys, not just an emotion or a psychological, but a true physical impact. I mean, I know there have now been studies, uh, which is my background, that it can really impact brain development in, in young children, this kind of chronic uh, stress. But as you were saying, advocating for these things is kind of typically outside of the pediatrician's normal uh, education and bag of tricks, if you will. Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we get pediatricians then to uh, recognize, acknowledge, and then do something about it? I'm going to defer to Dr. Meyer, who's the absolute, um, absolute, uh, uh, she's the absolute expert on this and has really uh, set the standard. Um, but I also want to say, for those of you on this call, if you have not read Maria Trent's AAP statement on um, racism in child health, there is a, a several calls to actions and recommendations for what we should be doing as pediatricians. Um, but Dr. Meyer has been living it, so I'm gonna have her um, speak to that. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. I, I think there are things that we can do within the practice and things that we need to do outside the practice. Um, 
I'll start, I guess, outside the practice because it's the space that we were talking in advocacy. And um, I think it's impossible to practice pediatrics in a vacuum. Uh, we're very well trained in medical school to look at the child and look at health from an ecological perspective and see the child in the context of the family. But uh, it behooves us to see the child and the family in the context of community and society with all the negative and positive impacts that this society has on the, ch on the health of the child. So uh, to really practice pediatrics, as Marina says, without having a, um, advocacy and what, without part of us, not all of us, but some of us devoting ourselves to the space that exists outside the practice, outside the academic medical center, is we're really practicing in a vacuum. We know now that most kids' healthcare happens in the home, in the school, and in the community. So those are the spaces that we pediatricians have to be present in order to do uh, make change that can ensure that every child can achieve their maximum potential. And I think within the practice, uh, there are things that we need to do. You know, if we are in primary care, or I think in pulmonary, or I'm looking at Linda in the ICU and the different specialties here, adolescent medicine represented in this panel, uh, again, we can't practice in a vacuum. So first we need to, within the practice, address root causes of disparities like social determinants of health. For practices, uh, pediatricians in this webinar who are in private practice and don't have a lot of resources, you can start with health literacy. What are our signs? Are we using universal precautions? Do we have language interpreters? Just is there a sign that welcomes every single person from every single background, whether they're documented or not, whether they're LGBTQ? Then uh, for those who have more resources, can we screen for food insecurity? Can we connect patients that have insecurity to the resources needed? The other one is in pediatrics, having a two generation approach for the young children. We can't see kids in the vacuum without the caregiver. Are we taking care of maternal depression, of domestic violence, of all the millennial morbidities that really are at the crooks of what causes a child to get sick nowadays. Uh, third, are we incorporating the science that you mentioned, Max, of early childhood? Are we making progress and in incorporating programs in our practices uh, that can decrease the cognitive gap and emotional problems that kids might have. So by the age of five, every single kid in our practice is ready to learn. If they need glasses, they have glasses. If they need special education, that are early intervention. And lastly, we can't do this alone. We cannot practice pediatrics in 2020, whether it's in an academic medical center, in a private setting, whether it's primary care of subspecialty, just us alone. We are dealing with societal ills here. So what is our relationship with social service agencies, with the school system, with the art, with the juvenile justice system? So I think there is room for all of us to do, and lastly and not least, and I'll leave this to other panelists, what are we doing with our students, medical students and residents, and how do we train a future generation of doctors that not only focuses on the family and the child, but also on community and society? I'm glad you said that because it sounds like the training that uh, young pediatricians need now is much broader than, than the classical training of physiology, anatomy, making sure they've got their vaccines, et cetera, and so forth, being aware of, as you said, the social determinants of, of health and, and the resources that, that, that may be available. But you touched briefly on that, and, and I don't know who, who may be more appropriate. What about this? Uh, we have a question about intergenerational transmission of some of this trauma that parents or caregivers that have uh, been through this, uh, I would think would be, I think that would be easily uh, passed along to their children, no? So there are a lot of studies that show intergenerational transmission of trauma and the toxic stress um, that I think all of, all of the panelists will describe or describe. There are studies about how much licking can a rat that been traumatized can do to the baby rat. And this is obviously transferred to mother baby diets. That's why I think uh, it is impossible to practice pediatrics nowadays in primary care without 
dealing with a dyadic the relationship between the caregiver and the child, a lot of the times the mother and the baby. And I think the brain change that you described, it really happens in the first three years of life where our brain is the most malleable and growing the most. And MRIs are showing changes in structural areas like the hippocampus and the amygdala and the prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex that really create long life consequences in cognitive function and social emotional regulation and memory. So it is in those first three years of life that we need to intervene as much as possible to try to buffer the effect of toxic stress. So I always tell my residents in the prescription pad, you know, sending a child to an available Head Start or finding a program in a park is as important of giving that vaccine. So there are things that we can do if we don't have at our fingertips by knowing the community that surrounds us and where our mm -hmm. lives that can buffer the impact of toxic stress. We cannot end racism and poverty as pediatricians in our practice, but we can help our families in that dyadic the relationship that's exposed to trauma to try to surpass that so that brain can develop the best way possible. I want to mention just this idea of trauma-informed care, which is just become a, a, something a, like a buzzword, but something that really people need to, um, to start thinking about. So when a parent comes in and they get very, very anxious very quickly about something that seems like a small thing, when they're when they're experiencing repetitive trauma over and over, which, you know, walking around with, you know, just uh, experiencing racism over and over and over, um, then when someone goes from zero to, to 10 and they, you know, whether it be a teenager or a parent, that, you know, kind of thinking maybe this person has been exposed to trauma. So trauma-informed care is, I think, something that we need to learn more about for sure. That should be a red flag that, that uh, yeah. you should be sensitive to. And also like an awareness of how we approach certain families and how we look at different families, the language that we use, all of that awareness has to begin from the moment that somebody decides to go into the medical field. It has to be an awareness that you carry throughout your whole career uh, and acknowledging your own biases, you know, first acknowledging that racism is real and it's structured and all the different components that we've described, but also that implicit bias is, is something that all humans have and the way to incorporate it into our practice is just the first step is being awareness aware of this biases and how it can affect care I'm and how we help families i'm glad you brought that up because i don't think i think very few people would acknowledge that they have some sort of uh internalized or implicit bias or, or racism built into the way they interact with people. But I think we're finding out more and more that it's, it's subtle and insidious. Uh, tell me about that, Linda, that, uh, you know, or how do we acknowledge that, you know, we all have some of that built into us, I think, from the way we, we've grown up and been raised. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and it's somewhat of like a the way that we train our brains as physician in terms of like rapid judgment, particularly from somebody like me in the ICU, you have to make uh, really quick decisions in a very short period of time in terms of determining, you know, who's sick, who's not, who needs my help immediately. And we have different kinds of thinking, like type one thinking um, is fast thinking, the sort of automatic response that you have. And then there's a second part of it uh, where you have the time to sort of process things and really think about what it is that you're encountering. And what we are trying to do early on in training with students, and Marina can speak about this as well, and our trainees, our residents, and our fellows, and now incorporated into our faculty, particularly in our institution, is that we need to have an awareness that this is something that everybody has. And unless people take the time to acknowledge their own personal biases, we're going to have giant blind spots. We're not going to see it. We're going to miss it. And this is how things happen. This is how children, uh, black children in the ED um, get less um, uh, pain medications uh, when they need surgery. Mm -hmm. Does any pediatrician go into practice thinking, today I'm not going to give pain medication to my patient? No. I can guarantee you that's not why we go into this. But because we have these biases that we don't, we're not even aware of, you create these blind spots where you, don't, you can't even see 
uh, the negative effects that it can have. So we need to start first having these conversations and the, these kinds of meetings so that people start having more awareness of their own biases so that they can start um, making changes or being aware of how it can affect their patients. And, and physicians are trained then to make that kind of quick, almost snap decision. Yeah. Is, is it something then that physicians should be taught to say, wait a minute, let me take a breath, take a beat and think about this and figure out, am I making this decision based on color, ethnicity, race, or, or true medical need? Uh, exactly. Is that yeah. part of the training? The patients. Yeah, these are the conversations of the powerful physician women in these group and this group we're having actively right now of how yeah. to uh, approach that problem. How do, how do we do it so that we incorporate it in, in the way that we practice so it's not only focused in the uh, general pediatrician's office, but throughout all the different encounters that we have in how do we do that? How do we uh, reach our trainees, but also our faculty and sort of bringing awareness so that we can uh, improve our practice? Because we can't turn a blind eye to uh, the, the evidence that there's disparities. I think, I think adding to that, yeah, I was just going to add to Linda's point that, um, yes, the, uh, identifying our own biases is certainly the first step in terms of taking action towards mitigating those biases and, and really sort of um, actively practicing how to decrease um, making judgments based on those biases. But I would also argue that physicians are in a position of power where we can call out one another um, and we can call out, you know, even trainees and things like that. When we see these sorts of things happening, we need to be able to speak up and be advocates and actually voice concerns. You know, I've had this happen just being on rounds with residents and fellows and stuff, just having people think through like, wait, why are we making this decision? And um, should we take a step back and think about if this was a different child, would we be making the same decision? So um, it's, it's literally the first step in a really long process. It's gonna be difficult to undo a lot of the racism that's been built in and ingrained in our country over the last 400 years. Uh, but I think every individual has a role to play, every single person. Absolutely, absolutely. So what else? What else, what other steps, concrete steps, points, do you think we can pass along uh, to our viewers here as to ways to, to address this, particularly in their own practices? Can I just say something about, I think Please. one important um, piece on this is to think about, it's, it's a, we focus a lot on the patients, but also for, you know, just as an educator, the students, the residents, the staff that you're working with also maybe having these experiences and um, recognizing that uh, it's not just about bias, it's also understanding your own power and privilege, and privilege so that I, perhaps I have walked into a room and been called, um, you know, people assumed I was not a doctor, um, but as a white woman walking into a room, it's very different than being um, a black or a Latinx woman. Um, and that, that, that recognizing that and that it, it is a it is a difference, right? That um, that um, I benefit from uh, basically white privilege uh, every single day, and being able to say that out loud, to recognize it, to talk about it with students, to be able to say, um, you know, if you're seeing something where you feel like there is bias in reporting, uh, you know, about. Um, uh, uh, some medical practice or that you're concerned for the family and reporting them to um, child services, um, that recognizing it, recognizing it in yourself and each other, being able to talk about it, that, that sometimes it's not just about bias, that there's a, the this, this system is rate of racism is there. And, and, and in, in, in putting it into your curriculum, also supporting your students, supporting your staff, um, making it something that you're explicitly talking about. I see in the Q&A people saying like, well, what can I do? Um, you know, first and foremost, we all have to be responsible for educating ourselves, right? Um, we have to, there are so many good resources to read right now, um, to really challenge ourselves to think differently, um, ways to um, support an entire interdisciplinary staff. People come at things with different education, different experiences, understanding one another, um, working together on this, 
explicitly stating it as a goal. So, you know, in our Office of uh, Education, Diversity, and Inclusion, we specifically state that this is an, diversity is important, changing our workforce to represent the kids and families that we care for, right? And that means that when we are hiring, um, we at minimum, right, we wanna make sure that the group um, maybe does implicit bias training, that we are saying we are going to explicitly uh, make an effort um, to make sure that diversity is part of the statement we're putting out about the um, the position so that it's actually attracting um, uh, more diver diverse folks. Like that's really important. And then when you actually are uh, getting someone into the workplace, how are you supporting them when they're there? Um, how are you making sure that um, it is a place that's safe where they can um, uh, be supported that they can continue in their uh, career. So those are all things that take a lot of um, time. But if we really want our patients to be comfortable, patients are more comfortable when um, they are taken care of by doctors, um, nurses, uh, MAs who look like them. Um, and that's just, that's been proven study after study. Um, so I think it, it is supporting the students, your workforce, your, your staff, um, and, um, and trying to be as explicit and honest about that. And, and, and that's what has to be said, you know, like, the, you know, like being saying, like, I really want to make a change. You can't make a change unless you're explicitly going to do it. Just saying like, you know, my hope is like, there's more graduates. The reality is there's still really low numbers of graduates um, in med school uh, who are, um, black and Latinx. And so that's, that's not going to, it's not going to just fix itself. We, we have to make explicit, itself, really. we have to explicitly not just recruit, Work but support. It. Yeah. We have to change our workforce. And, and, and to your point, I, there is no substitute for having a patient walk in and seeing their caregiver look like them. That, that just immediately drops the, the or raises the trust level and, and drops the barrier level, I think, to, to really be able to uh, improve that communication. Hedy, go ahead. I what wanted you to think? add to that, Max. I mean, yes, it would. Some, it's nice to have a provider that looks like you, but I think that having this, you know, good communication skills, empathetic communication skills can go a really, really long way. And in terms of what people can do, I think training your staff, but also making sure that your practice is not a segregated practice so that I think that if, if you know, as we look at COVID-19 and we looked at the deaths, you know, we look over in Brooklyn where there's overcrowded hospitals and poor quality of care. Um, so what about, you know, everybody committing to taking on a certain percentage of Medicaid patients, poor, poor patients into their practice, taking um, insurances like GHI, HIP, 1199 who care for the, the essential workers, children, and then, you know, bringing those folks in, advertising your practice, even if you're in a relatively segregated community, you know, saying we're open to everybody, advertising in, in maybe surrounding areas that, that have uh, minority populations, and then putting up pictures so that when they come, they're not seeing all pictures of white children or white families, making sure that your brochures mm -hmm. reflect that. But but really, I think we can actually integrate our own practices in addition, and then in addition to everything that Marina said, which I think is super important. I would also add, oh. No, I, I like those concrete. That's what I was after is some, yeah. some real concrete examples of things that uh, physicians, pediatricians can do in their own practices. But go ahead, Dodie. Yeah, no, I was going to add that another concrete example is uh, creating internal equity reports. So what are the equity metrics that we want to accomplish? Uh, so in the hiring process, you set up, given the size of your practice, how many minority physicians or ancillary staff, or what do you want your practice to look like uh, in terms of interpreter use? How many, what's the percentage of patients that needed interpreter that got it or not in, ter in terms of environment and signs in the practice in terms of outcomes, right? Are all asthmatics to Stephanie's, um, I'm looking at Stephanie here in the Zoom, but are all asthmatics getting exactly the same treatment based on the same level of asthma? So you create, you look at all your clinical outcomes and your quality outcomes and your patient satisfaction outcomes through an equity lens and you mm -hmm. 
create a report every single year looking at the data. Nothing speaks, you know, we all, it, when we talk about these things, like Linda says, none of us go to medicine to be racist. And we always say it's, it's the not me phenomenon, but these disparities exist. So it's all of us. So I think if we don't look at the data every six months or every month, we can convince ourselves very easily that we're not participating in the structural racism and we, but, but obviously, you know, because the disparity still exists. So I think equity reports on an annual basis are very important as a way to keep ourselves honest. So kind of to, to that point, the reality is I also though that a lot of physicians, pediatricians practice in what are de facto segregated communities. And so they're going to say, well, it doesn't really apply to me my practice is all white or all affluent or whatever. Does it apply to them and what should they do? What's their role then? I mean, I like to think that the people who have signed on to this particular webinar are interested in doing something, um, right? If, if not, then they wouldn't be here. Um, but I think that, you know, thinking about what's going on outside of your community, maybe going out and being a team doc, um, you know, advocating for, for, a, for, for a school system close to you, you know, trying to bring, bring patients in. Reaching um, out. I think yeah, reaching, reaching out. Reaching out and, and, and participating in advocacy at a national, at a state, at a city, at a county level. Uh, we forget that our voice is very respected, um, you know, mostly in the world, mostly in the country, for people who believe in science. So we have something to say, and that voice needs to be used. And I think we collectively underestimate our knowledge, our experience. We, we have a trove of stories, you know. We are so honored that patients come and tell us, the parents, the kids, they tell us their life stories. And those life stories, the legislator said, that's what passes a bill. It's the individual story backed by the data. So it doesn't have to be a change of how much money one makes or what community you practice. It's just how much commitment you have to be part of the larger voice that can really improve uh, disparities in child health for all populations. Community one thing I, writ large, not just the one you actually live in. I would also add that if there is a, a community or a practice that is quite segregated, think about why. Why is it that it's segregated and what potential resources do you have in that one practice or that one community that community does help sort of elevate those communities? And then think big. You know, uh, Dodi and Hetty, everybody here has had some really great practical examples of things that physicians can do, pediatricians can do. And I would just add that this is work, you know, this kind of stuff is not easy and this needs to, um, we need to be really committed to doing this work and reaching outside of our comfort zone and not just, you know, kind of passive saying, well, this doesn't apply to us, which of course, like Hetty says, if you're here, hopefully you recognize that you do have a role to play. Good, good, and just good. Um, simple things in the office, um, like what books you have, what authors, um, what are the subjects of the books? There's some wonderful children's books. One of our residents has put together, um, has been collecting wonderful children's books um, uh, that talk about um, uh, some of these topics we're talking about for kids in particular. Um, so even just thinking about, you know, what is represented in your waiting area for your um, uh, patients and their families to look at can just be a really uh, kind of low hanging fruit to think about. And I think just reformat the way that we think about this is it's, we're talking about people that have privilege, like Marina mentioned this before, like using that opportunity, that power, that authority, that voice that people have in the community to, to make, to have a deeper impact. And that I think it's just switching gears to like from not my problem, I'm not a racist to really, I'm going to do something, even if the impact is, small at first, but maybe it can have a larger impact by trying to target some of these specific points that my colleagues have mentioned. Have there been structural changes, say, in uh, both the med school curriculum, the post-grad training, uh, and even 
and I don't know if this necessarily applies directly to, to all of you, to uh, who gets accepted into PNS, uh, in, into Columbia's medical school. Um, what are we doing to, at that level, to increase the diversity uh, of, uh, of the students, the physicians coming up? So I don't know, Marina, do you want to start with the students? And or, he or Hedy, do you want to talk about? Yes, my phone is ringing, unfortunately. Okay. But um, so the, the medical school has taken um, equity and justice very seriously. And they have been very engaged in training um, students in implicit bias, social determinants of health, healthcare equity. And they're increasing that um, even now. The, one of the other things that the medical school does, which is huge, is that they have one of the biggest pipeline programs in the country. So that when we're talking about increasing the number of graduates from our local communities, from the Dominican community here, from the African American community, they're extremely involved in that. Um, but in general, what the medical student is, is doing now in terms of training students and faculty increasingly in structural racism, um, anti-racist, like basically anti-racism as an activist stance. So really talking to students about what are the steps that they can take, it, it all steps along their, their trajectory, be it um, making sure that they're using mindfulness to understand and, and that they're aware of the implicit biases that they may have that we all mostly have against African-Americans just because of the air we breathe in this country. Um, also, um, yeah, oh, training, training faculty. I kind of lost my train of thought, sorry. Okay. There is a, um, a bias um, reporting system for the students. And so there's a real commitment to assuring that, um, you know, if there are um, things that are happening in the clinical setting or the non-clinical setting um, that they are acted on. Um, and then several of the, as a clerkship director, so when they rotate through pediatrics, we specifically talk about um, determinants of health and, um, and, and, and really sort of how to um, how does this impact child health and, and what can you do as a student and um, what could you do in the future as a pediatrician with examples of some of the advocacy programs um, specifically that um, Dr. Meyer has set up in the community uh, as good examples um, so that I think that um, it, it's been a really I think important part of the curriculum for the students and then we have to, we have tried to mm -hmm. make it specific to pediatrics as well and then Linda can speak more to the um, to the residency and fellowship trainings for us we've been uh, very lucky that we have um, integrated a resident driven curriculum um, surrounding microaggressions implicit bias um, into our core um, conferences so that's part of what they get on a daily basis we felt very early on that it was very important to have these sessions as part of the main programming not as a side um, subject but really part integrated into what we do um, we have a council the pediatric diversity and inclusion council um, that um, we've had for the past seven years that includes uh, residents, fellows, faculty, um, all of the panelists are members of our council that have been very active um, in terms of uh, education workshops. Uh, we have a lar uh, an annual celebration of diversity symposium. We've had a wonderful speakers uh, to really broadcast this message to the department that diversity and inclusion is a type of priority. We've had incredible partnership uh, with Doty in community pediatrics. Uh, the, I always say the, the Diversity and Inclusion Council is basically married to community pediatrics because the trainees that we are recruiting that are passionate and invested in being part of the council are the same uh, trainees that are at the forefront of community pediatrics. So these are uh, folks that we are so lucky to have that are completely invested in elevating our mission. So it starts very early. We um, pride ourselves in the work that we've done. We make space to um, have difficult conversations. That has to be part of the, 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 the way that we continue this process because again talking about the blind spots we're not going to be able to address them until unless we have 
space to have these conversations, unless we take the time to acknowledge that there's disparities, that there's ways that we can do things better. So it's an ongoing process. And obviously that extends to fellowship training. And now we want to take it back to the faculty. A lot of our faculty, including myself, this was not part of our training as we were mm -hmm. going to medical mm -hmm. school. This was just not part of the things that we were made aware. And, and our evolution, thankfully, has now included being aware of, uh, of this major problem that we have is that we don't acknowledge our biases. So all of that um, creates a better work environment. And that's why we have a wonderful partnership also with our office, um, you know, diversity and inclusion and the learning environment, which is all tied together. Um, Right, let, let, let me ask a, a, a kind of a, a, a sorry, Dodi, because I think you'll you'll want to be uh, answer a, a good part of this. Let me ask this kind of a multi pronged question here, because in my reporting over the years, I was oh, I, I, I remember being surprised when uh, someone in public health said to me, "Tell me your zip code, and I'll tell you your health." Um, and, and I was I was somewhat surprised. Those are, uh, of course, some of the social determinants of health that we've talked about. And Stephanie uh, spoke of some of the environmental uh, reasons for that. Uh, but I don't think we can talk about that without talking about access to care. Access to care being uh, whether it's health insurance or just having clinics, doctors in in the neighborhoods. How what do we do about about that? How do we improve access to care? And if some of you can also give me some concrete examples of these health disparities. We've talked a lot about disparities, but I've seen some of the studies and some of the statistics are truly shocking uh, when it comes to the differences in uh, the disparities in health outcomes. So let's talk disparity, out uh, outcome disparities, and access to care. With access, you know, I would think that now with COVID, we have uh, one of the panelists mentioned there's a direct overlay of social determinants and we've had maps throughout the city. We did it with our NYP patients, but you have mm -hmm. it with OH, where uh, crowding uh, completely overlays with COVID mortality and morbidity, uh, food insecurity the same. And I think specifically now during this pandemic, access does not mean that the patient comes to a practice. Access means that we are where the patients are. Mm -hmm. so we are, we have, a, and we're lucky in our system to have a large school-based health center clinics, but that's where the kids are. They are in schools. So pediatricians have to be in schools. Uh, we, because of COVID, we have hundreds of kids, thousands of kids around the country didn't get vaccines. We need vaccine vans. We need to park ourselves in hot spots where kids are unvaccinated. Parents cannot tra travel now easily because of COVID. So we need to be where the kids are. So this whole idea that we are sitting in a practice and people have to come to us from nine to five is completely obsolete and not congruent with the kids that needs us the most. We need to be there in the evenings and be there in the weekends and be accessible where we are. This whole telehealth exploded during COVID and mm -hmm. It has its problems and it's complicated and I'm tired of looking at avatars and not touching real kids, but you know, it's a comfortable for a lot of moms and for a lot of kids. Let's do that. So I think we need to think differently about access. We're luckily that lucky that we live in New York City, New York State, where we have universal health insurance. Every child till the age of 18 documented or undocumented can get Medicaid emergency Medicaid, Medicaid. It's not the reimbursement of commercial. Let's use that. Every single pediatrician can see all these kids, but where they are, not where we are. Nobody brings up a great point because it's, we have to think of multi diff, multiple different approaches. You know, even you mentioned telehealth, not all families can do telehealth, you know, and just thinking through about how every means of communication or interacting with patients, making sure that we're broad scoping and broad thinking um, in how we're going to actually reach our patients. Maybe telehealth doesn't work for a family and they need to come in or they need to have a telephone visit. We need to be accommodating of that. That reaching out, couldn't I, I, I couldn't agree more. You have to go to where the people are. You can't yeah. just and say, when you said zip code, they will come just doesn't work anymore. 
Yeah, and when you said zip code, I, I was going to say after Linda spoke that the first week that our interns come, not this year because of COVID, we do a walking tour of the community. We cannot have our residents start the residency for three years living in a bubble. So we make sure they go into a school, they go into a botanica, which is the Latino home remedy shop. We make sure that they, they go to a, um, a bodega, which is our equivalent of a corner store deli. And we make sure that they visit community-based organizations. And, and also that they see the parks. And obviously we link it with all health issues. But I always tell the residents, whether you practice in the most affluent neighborhood in the country or the most impoverished, at least once a year, just once a year, spend two hours walking the neighborhood. Just learn what's out there. Just look at the context. It doesn't take more than that. Um, and then doing a home visit. It, it, it's a lot of effort to leave your office and all that, but just at least do one a year. It gives you a sense of the context in which people live. And then that makes us better doctors. Absolutely. Uh, forgive me for giving a sort of a personal anecdote that relates to that. But uh, some years ago, I'm, I'm Cuban by, uh, by birth and, and by ethnicity. But uh, many years ago, I visited uh, Cuba where they don't have two aspirins to, to rub together. Uh, yet by most uh, objective metrics, they, they do as well uh, or better than we do, particularly in, in metrics of, of primary uh, health care. And it was because the primary health, uh, primary doctor, healthcare doctor, lived in the community that they served and spent time there and knew all of his patients. He or she was part of that community. So there, there's also, I think, no substitute uh, for, for that uh, as well. You've got to know who uh, who you're who you're dealing with and who you're treating, and there's no substitute for taking. Uh, my, I had a manager once who called it management by walking around. Well, this is medicine by walking around, I guess. Um, and, and Dodie, you also touched on, but I think this is also important, that what happens at, at the state and federal, city, state and federal level in terms of uh, policies that impact healthcare, um, you, I think physicians for too long have been have sort of sat back and, and let some of these things happen to them or around them. Uh, is the message here that you that we all need to get involved because it, it, it otherwise things will happen that are going to not just impact our, our practices financially, but impact all of our patients? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all very busy and uh, we all do our best and we all can't do everything, but definitely there's a group of us who like advocacy or uh, us who like community health, that, that we need to do that. And it is very important, I think, at the school uh, and at the residency level and fellowship level to train residents. We have a very vocal group of residents and they uh, launched an advocacy group. So they, you know, we support them, the program supports them to go to Albany and to go to uh, City Hall. Uh, we work with the American Academy of Pediatrics and we work with Citizens Committee for Children for everybody who's in this webinar. In the city, we're lucky that we have this nonpartisan advocacy organization uh, and we really walk the streets and uh, hone on messages. You know, we obviously have very strict lobbying laws uh, because we're in a nonprofit institution, but um, but we can educate the legislators and again, we can tell our stories. So. I don't think we all have to do everything, but I think pediatrics has a very important voice. Yeah, and, and the lesson is, I've always said, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and, and if you don't squeak, you ain't getting the grease, and, and in this case, grease is money, uh, or policies uh, of some sort. Um, I see we're, we're kind of getting close to, to the end of our hour here, and when, when we do these webinars, I like to ask each of our panelists for a, um, a little nugget, a take home pearl of wisdom, uh, as it were. Um, and, but please be brief. Um, <laughs> brief is important here. Give us, give us a little pearl of wisdom uh, here. Uh, uh, Dodi, can we start with you? And then I'll, I'll go around sort of uh, counterclockwise on my screen here. 
there's a book by Anne Lamott called Bird by Bird, and uh, she's you know struggling and uh, with getting on with her life and uh, writing and drawing and all that, and suddenly. I think it's her mother that says, uh, how do you do it? How do you start describing all these birds? And it's bird by bird. You know, it's one step at a time. Uh, otherwise, it feels too overwhelming. The, uh, the, the, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Uh, Linda. I would, I would encourage people to remember, just take the moment with everything that's going on in the world, just take a moment to remember why you went into medical school to begin that, that enthusiasm, that, that passion, um, when everything seems so overwhelming. And like Jody was saying, like, it seems like it, this is impossible. If we can remember that, that reason why we went into this, it will help us stay motivated to do the work to learn more about ourselves, to learn more how we can help each other, how we can help our patients and their families. Um, so if we can keep some of that enthusiasm and bottle it up and use it when we have really bad days, I think that would be helpful. Rekindle that fire. Um, the words of wisdom I would have would be to talk to your patients. We can learn so much from our patients, especially if you have a patient that might be different from you in some way, whether it's, you know, they're from a different background or they look a little different. I think just having these open conversations and being able, being open and embrace yourself to learning from people around you, um, I think that will help expose a lot of the concerns and issues that they have, but that are shared by many who are like them. So. Good. Marina. Uh, I think I would say um, uh, that in working with students, I know that many other people on the call may not be working with students, but you're working with young people who, um, I can't tell you how many students um, talk about uh, that pediatrician that sort of had faith in them and connected with them and, um, uh, you know, kind of said like, hey, what are you interested in? Oh, I think you'd be a great doctor. Um, uh, to remember that um, every young person that you interact with um, is also going through what everybody else in the country is going uh, through. Uh, ask the questions, um, connect with them, keep them motivated. Um, they may not be able to have these conversations in their schools and their families. They may want to have conversations like some of what we're talking about today. Um, because of the different experiences they're having and just uh, that that can make a really big difference in the life of a young person um, and they remember it. Um, the first question I ask on our orientation day for pediatrics is, um, can you tell me uh, what they're most worried about, about the rotation, what they're most excited about, and then tell me an interaction you had with a healthcare provider because not everybody had a pediatrician and it is um, always uh, humbling and um, that may uh, help you all and also help a young person. Hedy, you started us off, so I think it's only appropriate that uh, you wrap it up for us. Well, I guess I, I would recommend that everybody take the Harvard IAT test um, that um, is a way of, of looking at implicit bias. Take the race one. And there's a wonderful book called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, which talks about thinking without, without thinking and, and really um, lets us view our own subconscious a little bit more. When we're talking about health disparities, one of the biggest health disparities in this country is in children with pain management. And so children who go to emergency rooms, um, black children get much less pain medication than white children. And this disparity is the biggest in Northeast hospitals, teaching and non-teaching hospitals. So when we think maybe it's not us, it is us and we should need to, um, be able to um, feel, know that and, and to sense our own discomfort and to act on that. So. Yes. In one way or another and, and take a look at ourselves and, and see what we see and then have be open to having these difficult and, and hopefully non-judgmental conversations so that we can hear from those around us uh, what they really think about and what they see in us that we may not see in ourselves. Um, and I think that, or that's so hard to do, but that's what, we're, that's what we really have to have to start uh, with. Uh, I want to thank our panelists who are just terrific. Uh, 
uh, I know I learned and heard a lot that, that, that I'm going to remember today, and I hope our viewers did as well. Uh, this re we have recorded this uh, webinar, and after it gets cleaned up a little bit, it will be uh, posted for uh, anyone to see and go back and, and listen to. And also, um, in a few days, all of uh, the registered uh, viewers will also receive a, a summary document that uh, will highlight some of the most important points that, that we've uh, uh, covered tonight. So again, thank you all. We hope truly that this has been uh, of use, of service, and that this will begin these difficult conversations that we all have to have because it's not going to change unless we have those conversations. Thank you. Stay safe. Be well. Good night, Thank guys. Thank you, Max. It was great moderated. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you.